and then we'll jump into the, to the word. So thanks so much. Am I on? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good morning. In today's message, we'll hear about discord between Abrams and Lot's herdsmen. They just couldn't get along. They were fighting. There was a lack of peace. This kind of unrest sounds a lot like today's headlines. Thankfully, we have God's word as our hope during these difficult days. Russia could be on the verge of invading Ukraine. But the word of God says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. John fourteen twenty seven. Lord, please help us to focus on your peace when we feel surrounded by conflict. Harsh winter weather worsens humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 7. Father, it's hard to understand the disasters we see in the world. Please give us your peace, which transcends all understanding. More than 5 million perish from worldwide pandemic, and that number keeps growing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 13. Heavenly Father, you are the God of hope. Please fill us with your hope when we feel hopeless. Tsunami in Tonga brings unprecedented disaster. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. Lord, when life seems out of control, please help us remember that you are a God of peace. Growing inflation sends the U.S. closer to a major recession. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Matthew 5, 6. Precious Lord, you know our needs. <clears throat> when we are worried about meeting them, please help us keep our eyes on you. Infighting and divisions linger across the U.S. long after elections fade. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Matthew 5, 9. God, you can heal any division. Please work through our peacemakers and heal our country. Tragically, the U.S. murder rate is the highest it's been in 25 years. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Romans 16:20. Lord, thank you for the reassurance that your final victory will be complete and will be soon. And finally, Lord, thank you for these words from Hebrews 13, 20, 21. Now may the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Thank you, Rex, for that. Boy, I love that peace. <clears throat> it's more than just a peace, but it, it, it informs us and teaches us. So, obviously, they just took some headlines from this last week. Here is something that's happening in the world, things that we read on our phones or hear in the news. And we hear certain um, stories all the time. And often they are bleak and they're <laughs> distressing and discouraging. And so taking a headline, just like they did, and then searching Scripture. Okay. And there's wonderful tools out there that you can put in a, a word like the peace in Scripture or hope in Scripture or encouragement or Scripture in Scripture. And taking God's Word then and applying it to a situation 
um, reorientating and refocusing our minds, right, about what God's Word says. And then from events that we all participate in and see and read about, we take the Word of God and then remind ourselves of the truth, and then from that, there's prayer. And we're praying God's Word to situations. And we can do this time and time and time again. So I want to encourage us as a body of Christ, a local congregation, that we would read and think and pray this way. Instead of just being shocked by a headline and, oh, isn't that horrible, right? Let's respond with, this is shocking, that is horrible. God, what do you have to say to this? And God, help me to pray into this circumstance and situation. I would encourage us all to pray and think along similar lines. So again, thank you for leading us with those words this morning and helping us to think this way. So everyone's faith journey is uniquely personal and also individual. Coupled with that, all of ours, everyone's faith journey is strikingly similar and shared. As we are walking with Abram and Sarai, which become Abraham and Sarah, as we are walking with them, as their story is recorded in the Holy Word of God, we see them. And in seeing them, we also see ourselves as the Holy Spirit illuminates His Word to our hearts and minds so that we learn, that we are encouraged, that our hope will grow as we continue to wait for all of God's promises yet to be fulfilled. So in and through this series, we are learning and embracing this phrase to trust God's promises by living a life of faith. We trust God's promises in our heart, storing these words up here. And we trust them by living a life of faith. And sometimes we are standing tall and walking forward. And other times there are miscues and missteps and misunderstandings. Just like we read in Scripture. The encouragement is to learn from these things, to gain wisdom, and to continue to move forward with perseverance and obedience and worship and prayer in our lives of faith. That God in so doing would be glorified in us in our families, in our situations, in our community, echoing into eternity. And in following him, there would be a greater sense of worship and connection and fullness and satisfaction as God continues to shape us and conform us into the image of his Son. So this is our third installment. And if you have been listening, we open it up and saw this man. And at points of a transition, God spoke to him. Like God speaks to us often in points of transition where we have a choice to make. Either to follow his way, his word, and his promises. Or to journey how we think is best for us. Abraham and Sarai stepped out, brought their uh, nephew Lot with them, and did well. And then last week we saw when famine, a severe 
famine, when a hardship came, and hardships come to us all in our journey of faith. Abram, in his point of learning, and his wife took some missteps and believed in their own wisdom and their own power and their own sovereignty and got into some major trouble. But God was faithful to his promise to them and his promise to us because he could not disown himself. He is faithful to his word, period, even if we aren't faithful to ours. God made a way back for this couple as he makes ways back for us when we wander to again join him and follow after him. And Abram and Sarai did so, and then they returned to the place where they had left and worshipped God. This morning we're going to see some more tests, and we'll see now in comparison how Abram and Sarai responded to this first hardship is how they're going to respond to this next conflict. And so this is the first point, following God's word, following God's word leads us to <laughs> tests, right? Tests. Dave, why are you saying that? Well, right here in the Word. So let's turn open. Genesis chapter 13. I'm reading from the NIV, probably for this series. And the words will be for, with, uh, for us on the screens as well. So here we go as we are continuing this story. They've been now back in the land. They are worshiping God. They're following his ways. And then <laughs> there's some more tests. Now Lot... Their nephew, who was moving about with Abram, he'd been with him in this process. He had no doubtly have heard the promises of God, and he continued to go the course with Abram and Sarai. And so they also had flocks. He also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together. For their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling, bickering, arguing arose between Abram's herders and Lot's herders. Also, the Canaanites and the per Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. We'll pause right here. So what's happening? Again, Abram, Sarai have these promises. They stepped out. Lot was with them. God was faithful to his promises that those who blessed Abram would be blessed. Those who dishonored him would be dishonored. And these things had occurred. And Lot was blessed in their mm, fields and their people and their possessions were blessed. And so because of God's blessing, because they were following God, there arose conflict, which tells us that if you and I are following God's word, this does not exempt us from conflict. Even conflict within families. Has anyone ever had a conflict in their home, right? All of us, right? In good, Christian, God-fearing, Bible-believing families, there's conflict sometimes with spouses, with children, with parents, in a community of faith in churches. You know that sometimes there's conflict in churches. <laughs> it happens. 
even when we are, and sometimes because we are following God in faith. So don't be surprised, don't be alarmed, don't be caught off guard that in your family of faith and in your family that there will be at times tests. So why? And we see this, that here he is now in the land, and there's conflict within, and there's dangers without. The Canaanites and the, um, <laughs> I get this word wrong all the time. I want to say parasites, but that's not what it is. Whatever they are, right? These other people, I'm just going to skip that, right? Are there, reminding us that there was still dangers, outside, but there is also conflict inside, and there was this struggling over stuff, right? Existence. There was now a, another famine of sorts, where there wasn't, didn't seem to be enough. And so the question is, why does God allow tests and trials, right? Have you ever asked that? People throughout all ages have asked that question. It's a good question to ask. God, I thought in following you, everything will go right, go great. And now it, there's difficulties and I'm not getting along with my wife or my child or this situation. Why does this happen? The word of God answers that question for us. Because God, in these trials and difficulties, and they're in these hardships and heartaches, is working in us maturity. Maturity. Let me break down a verse here that James, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote to us. Now, this is interesting. And we're going to go from the end to the beginning. Right? So you look at the end goal here. I go on this side. Verse 4, my handy laser. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So the goal is that we would be mature as Christians, as humans, complete as in knowing God's word and his word knowing us, not lacking anything we need for life and God godliness. This is God's working in us through your lifetime. He's helping us to become mature. He's helping us to become dependent and complete upon God's word. He's helping us to grow up as his children. That's his end goal. So how does this happen? Well, it happens through perseverance, that we continue to go through things. Well, how does perseverance occur? Well, perseverance happens that we need to persevere through something, which is testings of our faith. This produces perseverance. So testing is necessary for perseverance. Perseverance is necessary that we be mature. So in testing, how does testing come? Well, it comes through trials of many kinds. And so when we see trials of many kinds, we're supposed to do what? What? Consider it pure joy? I wasn't considering a pure joy when I had to get up extra early this morning to shovel. I didn't consider it pure joy when the internet in my office didn't work and I couldn't print things. I didn't consider it pure joy when I was coughing up phlegm this morning in copious amounts. Ooh, big word, Dave. But when I and you think about what this is doing for us, persevere, understand what matters, I'm doing getting up this morning because I believe worshiping God is worth any lack of sleep or cold face or anything. 
So if we know what the end is, it helps us to have perspective from the beginning. That is the result of perspective that comes from maturity, which comes from perseverance, that you overcome things that are difficult in your past. You understand this, right? So when we have trials and difficulties, God is using them to conform us into the image of his son. So the response is persevere. Recognize what God's doing. God, thank you that you're giving me an opportunity to remain faithful to you, to look at your promises, and to continue to move ahead, knowing what is true, what is right, what is good. And God, help me to do this. I need your perspective. And God, give me joy in knowing that you are working in my life through this trial. That's a good perspective. That does not come naturally, right? We naturally complain, right? How many of you had to ch train your children to become complainers, right? Thank you for the laughter, right? They do it naturally, right? How many of us had to train our children to disobey us because that's what we really want? We don't. Why? Because that comes naturally. These things come super naturally. I call them OTO's opportunity to overcome, friend. And in so doing, we grow in maturity, we help other people, and we move forward. So this process happens in our life. This process was happening with Abram and Sarai, right? They had difficulties in the land of famine. They step back, they learn, they step forward, and now they're moving together, and now there's some other difficulties. These things happen. So let's see how they now respond to this ordeal. Next point, trusting God's word leads us to peace. Okay. Let's follow this. Let's see what's here. Verse 8. So, Abram took the lead since he was the oldest. He was the leader. He understood that there was conflict. He wasn't passively just letting it develop. He understood, and he made a decision. So Abram said to his nephew Lot, Hey man, let's not have this fighting and quarreling and bickering between us. I want this to be done. Or between your herders, your workers, and mine. For Lot, we're close relatives. Now is not the whole land before you? Now notice that. He didn't say us. He said you. Right? He's problem solving here. So let's part company. Now, Lot... If you choose to go to the left, then I'll go to the right. But if Lot, if you decide that you want to go to the right, well, then I'll go to the left. Let's pause here. So what's happening? So Abram, rightly the leader, right, chooses to step aside. And allow someone else to go first. This was completely different than how he responded to the last disaster, right? The last time some conflict took place, there was a lack of resource. And often, conflict starts with a lack of resource, and then there's conflict as to who will go first, whose will is stronger, who will win, who will survive, who will emerge the victor. That's what conflict often is about. Control, power, will, dominance. 
So Abram, instead of thinking, well, the blessings were to me, Lot, you're kind of like an add-in. I'm going to go over here and just get away from me, young man. He didn't say that. He says, hey, I love you. We are close relatives. I don't want to fight with you. So you decide what you think is best, and I'll take what's the rest. How was Abram able to say this? He did so because he trusted in the promises of God. He knew that he did not need to fight for what he needed. He trusted God to provide what he needed because God told him, I will make you a great nation. God told him, I will bless you. God told him that he would be a blessing. So he believed that and he said, hey, I'm going to step away. Step aside and allow him to be first. I'm going to tell you this, that trusting God's word leads to peace. How much of your conflict is over lack of time, money, energy? God, I'm going to give the best to someone else, and I trust You will take care of me. I'm tired of conflicts that happen over stuff. Just a matter of time after you close the casket on mom or dad, then the games begin. Grabbing and the getting and the wanting and my rights and my stuff and my position because I am blessed by God. If you're blessed by God, let it go. Abram Learn. This is stark contrast to what he did last time. He said, hey, Lot, you go first. I've learned that grabbing on and deceiving and trying to um, um, whittle my way or get my way in leads to disaster. So I'm trusting God. Hey, Lot, you decide what you want and I'll do something else. Right? Change, massive change, trusting in God, allowing God's promise to lead him. And I want to encourage you the next time that you are in conflict, choose prayer and trusting God's promises versus hanging on and fighting over stuff that in the end you probably won't want anyway. Thank you for the amens. I'm encouraged. Listen, this will help you. (laughs) And so this is a choice that Abram made. And now Lot, the spotlight was on him. He was taking charge. He was in the lead. He had a choice to make. So let's see how he responds. And here's the point before we read the passage. Forgetting God's word leads to loss. Leads to loss. So let's Read this. So Lot and Abram are having this conflict. Abram steps aside. Lot, you chose. So Lot steps up, perhaps on a mountain, overlooking as far as he could physically see. So Lot looked around, verse 10, and he saw that the whole plain of the Jordan towards Zor, which is a town, a city around that area, It was well watered. It was like the garden of the Lord. That is the garden of Eden. It was beautiful. It was lush. It promised kind of an easy life, abundance of things. It looked pretty good, right? It looked like the land of Egypt where they just came from. Now, 
as Moses wrote Genesis. He wrote it later, after Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. He's telling the Israelites and telling us, now this was, of course, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Because the Israelites knew when he was writing this, that place became a desert. But before it was destroyed, it was like a lush garden. Verse 11, so Lot, <laughs> underline this, chose for himself. What did he choose? Well, the whole plain of the Jordan. And he set out towards the east. Now the two men parted company. Now Abram lived in the land of Cana, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now, the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. So Lot, at this time, certainly knew God's promise to Abram, that God would make him, Abram, into a great nation. That God would bless him, Abram, and make his name great, and make him a blessing to the families on the earth. And those who blessed Abram would be blessed. And those who dishonored him would be cursed. Right? Lot certainly, <laughs> excuse me, learned some lessons from this man, and he was certainly blessed because of his connection to Abram and honoring him. So Lot at this time, if he was thinking about God's promises, now check this, right, could have said to Abram, Abram, thank you for that generous offer Thank you for allowing me to have the best part of the land. But Abram, God is blessing you. And God's word is to you, and I'm blessed because of it. So Abram, you decide where you want to go. Abram, you take what's best. I want to bless you by stepping aside and saying, Abram, I want to bless you. I want to honor you, and you do what you think is right. And I'll trust God to take care of me. Lot could have said that, right? But Lot, forgetting this promise, decided to take the best and not bless Abraham by allowing him to have the best. And the deal is <laughs> that God changed Lot's name as well. He started as a lot, he ended as a little. The joke worked. <laughs> Most of mine don't. But it's true. If you think about this, if you know his story, I'm so glad you're laughing, that makes me feel good. It's true, he started with tons of stuff. Why? Because he was with the promise and the promised one of God. You see in this? And he thought, I'm going to get more, and it's going to be better, it's going to be easier, this is going to be awesome. And then if you know the story, and we'll get into the story, he started out as a lot, he ended up in a little, he ended up just with him and his two daughters in a cave. And that's a bad story, by the way, and we'll read it. Why did that happen? Because he forgot God's Promises. So when we forget God's promises, what we think is a lot turns out to be a little. And living to contrary to God's word, more always becomes less. You have more holding on to God's promises than you have holding on on to anything this world has to offer. If you hear anything today, hear just what I just told you. We all have opportunities to grab on and to hang on, and we have to um, 
Ask God, God, is this your path for me? Is this your way for me? And if it is, go in that direction. But if it's not, then don't, regardless of what it looks like. And living contrary to God's word more always becomes less. Please, I beg, it's probably not, I don't know, I beg you, for your sake, for God's sake, believe, trust, let go of some things, trust that he'll help to provide, he'll help in conflict, don't grab on what you think is going to be better. We get in all types of problems when we do that. Trust him, it's going to lead to internal peace. Give up some things that you think are so important, which they're not. It's better to hold on to the promise. Abram learned this. And Lot, you know, Lot could have said, you go this way, and, and Abram could have lived in that spot, and God would have blessed him. Forgetting God's word leads to loss. Now, in contrast, trusting God's word leads us to reward. Verse 14, Genesis 13. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, here was Abram standing here, not knowing how it's all going to work out. Lot and his entourage went to the best part of the land. Abram was faced with whatever was left, and so he was there after he left, living in the choice that he made, looking over and wondering, perhaps, okay, what should I do now? And after Lot parted from him, God again spoke to him. And God meets us in times of testing and transition in ways that he doesn't perhaps at other times. God came to Abram and said, Abram, hey man, look around. Look around from where you are. Look, Abram, to the north. And this is north here in this building. Look to the north. Hey, Abram, just turn there. Look to the south. Look. Just look around. Abram looked to the east. By the way, which direction did Lot go? Went to the east. It tells you that in the previous passage. Look to the west. All the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make you your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Now go, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you, Abram. This is incredible. Now remember, at the beginning, I said that God repeats his promise to Abram seven times in his life. And each time it comes after... Abram stepping forward in faith, and then part of the, replan, the plan is revealed a little bit more. Abram, this is the land that I talked to you about over here. Abram, when I told you about descendants, I'm going to tell you a little bit more. You're going to have so many descendants that it's like the dust or the sand on the seashore. It's going to be that vast, Abram. And Abram, because you trusted in me, not only am I going to fulfill this, and, only the, and not only the part that you gave away, that's going to be yours as well, right? And Abram, you can trust me. Now go out. I know there's difficulties outside. I know that there is pressures within, and you trusted me, and those are being taken care of. Now these people who are out here, the Canaanites and the <laughs> parasites, I'm just going to say that, those guys that are, that, who are out there, hey, trust me that I'm going to be with you. Just step out, 
going to reward you. What freedom there was for him in trusting that God was going to be true to his word, trusting that what he believed by faith will soon become sight and will see these things unfold in his life. And yes, they make more mistakes, but every time they trusted God's word, it led to reward. And every time you trust God's word, it will lead you to good places and to God's reward. Even though there might be some difficulty because we do not have to be afraid for I am with you and I am giving this to you. Learn from this, right? It's not just an interesting story like, oh, that's interesting, so you can win first place in Bible trivia, right? It's more than that. Oh, where am I trusting? Where am I holding on? Where am I scared? If I went around and asked you, what are some of your fears? Everyone in here will have a, a fear to tell me. I have them too. God, what are you saying? Help me to hold on. Help me to trust you. Help me to see. Help me to be faithful. Trusting God's word leads to reward. Or reconfirmation, recommitment based on continued trust results in great reward. And for those who trust in anything or anyone else, then God and his word will suffer loss. I can say this this strongly because the New Testament reaffirms this as Paul and as James and as Peter were reflecting upon what they knew through Christ and seeing through the lens of Jesus into the Old Testament. These principles and these um, promises continue to be brought forward into the New Testament and into, well, we're in the New Testament times and they saw this. And so Paul said this, and this is interesting. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, which sums up these points. It says, by the grace God has given me, this was Paul the apostle, I laid a foundation as a wise builder as someone else, um, and someone else is building on it. What's this foundation? Paul's job was setting the foundation on Jesus Christ, the cornerstone the author and the finisher of our faith, that he is the Messiah. He is the Christ. This is the solid rock on which we stand. He says, I had the job of building a foundation, right? And someone else, each of us actually are building on it. But each one, which includes us, should build with care, should build our life with care, how we build our faith home, so to speak. It says, for no one can lay any foundation other than that was already laid, which is Jesus Christ. We say amen. But if anyone builds on this foundation, so this is talking to Christians, understand me here. People building their life on Christ, living their life, making their choices, moving for no one can lay any foundation other than it's already been laid. And if anyone builds on this foundation, you have a choice what materials you will build with. Right? Not physical, okay? Conceptual, reality type of stuff, choices we make. If you build your life on gold, silver, costly stones with these things that last. Or you can choose wood, hay, or straw. Verse 13, their work, my work, will be shown for what it is when. Because the day will bring it to light. What day is that? Well, it will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. It's a day that we're judged. And if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. There's the word reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. There's the word loss. Okay. But yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. This is really 
some serious verses. Lot's a great example of this. Following God's word was blessed, okay? It's connected, following in faith, decided, you know what? I'm going to take the best for myself. I'm going to forget about this word that says, hey, if you dishonor him, you'll be dishonored, be cursed. And he did his own thing. He thought it was great. Ended up really badly, literally fire coming down. And he escaped, not with all the stuff. There was no, he didn't bring any herds with him. Didn't bring any workers with him. Didn't even bring his wife with him. He escaped as, as one through the flames. Still saved, so to speak, because of God's mercy to Abraham <laughs> and to him. Some people, they come to faith and then they just build their life with stuff that won't last for eternity. Who cares how big your spoon collection is? I have a spoon collection. In the end, will that matter? No. So if people want a spoon, take yourself a spoon. The choices that you and I make, are, are they done? Do we choose to pick people up? It's inconvenient, right? Sometimes, Eric? He doesn't want to say it, but yes, it is. To make a meal for someone on the meal train. To write a check, and you could use that money for something else. We say, God, I trust you. For deciding how you're going to live, or if you're going to stay because of a church. These things will last because they're done in faith. These things matter. And when our lives are tested, I want you to have great reward. And that re reward is beyond this life. Just did a funeral yesterday. And, you know, people are nice often. Say, thank you, that was a great service. And I tell them, no, Bill made it easy, right? It was easy to talk about Bill Ginnhart. Why? Was Bill perfect? No. Right. He wasn't perfect. Did he fail at times? Absolutely. Just like me. Just like you. But he's decided, I'm going to continue to persevere. I'm going to continue to give. I'm going to continue to go. I'm going to continue to love people. I'm going to continue to serve. I'm going to continue to do all these things. And I told them that Bill is more alive now than anyone here on this planet. By the way, we're all living in the terminal ward. Right? He's more alive now than we are, friends. These bodies are as good as they are breaking down. Live for the day. The songs you sing, the gifts you give, and the paint you put on walls, and the flowers that you plant, and the love that you give, the money that you give. We do it in faith, trusting that with God is always more. It's faith. And so this is why um, if we look at people who just give. Why? Because they're looking for a better home. That's <laughs> why we have Hebrews chapter 11. This is why Pastor Key gets up to preach to Myanmar folks that are suffering and they're, they count it better to live in the jungle with Christ than live in their home without him. Please think this way. Please. Trusting God's word leads to reward. Forgetting God's word leads to loss. Even though it seems more here, what about it? It's like all going to burn up? Do you really need five houses? 
Really? How is that helping the kingdom of God? Maybe you need five houses because you house five needy families. Okay. You understand this concept. I don't need to go further. Think, please. Last point. <clears throat> last thing in our passage this morning. <laughs> Believing God's word leads us to worship. And you'll see this, right? So at the end of this, you'll see Abram often, what does he do? So Abram, verse 18. So Abram, he went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron. Where he, what did he do? He set up camp again, started out and started over again. And what did he do? He built an altar to the Lord. The truth is, everywhere you go, there he is. He is. Some of you undoubtedly will move away from Rockford. If you are a person of faith, if you're a person of the word, one of the first things you do after finding a place to live and your job is finding a place to worship, setting up an altar. Hopefully you come to church to worship the God who is worthy. Versus, well, this is what I've been doing for 50 years. Hopefully you come to a place of worship not because your friends are here, and I hope you have friends here. I really do. I hope you come to church more than while I'm here on the days that I serve in nursery. But other times I'm not. Well, why? Well, I'm obligated. You know what's a lot better? We come to church because God's here. And he's worthy of our praise. I want to join together in worshiping him. I want to sing the songs of praise. And this, again, is not just a warm-up we do. Opportunity to remind ourselves, God, you are worthy. You are holy. You are good. Be thou my vision. And so when you go other places, and you may jump into churches and breaks my heart when people move away and they, you know, finding a church is kind of like way down the list. Or they get to it when they want and they get around to it. One Sunday leads to a month, leads to a year, leads to two years, leads to a decade. So believing God's word always leads us to worship the God of the word. So let's be people of the word. Let's continue to learn from Abram and Sarai, from Lot, from these things that were written long before. Remember this, so we'd learn, so that we'd have encouragement, that we'd have greater hope, that we would continue to persevere, holding on to the promises. So hold on today. Walking in the journey of faith according to the promises of God's word leads us to great reward. Knowing that God will always be true to his word. Do you believe that? Always. Along the way, we'll have tests, we'll have hardships, we'll have difficulties. Continue to choose and trust in the promises of God. And if you misstep, return. Come back. Continue to move forward because testing and trials makes us stronger, more like Christ. And the Holy Spirit continues to work in us and through us to conform us into the image of His Son. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to conclude, and we'll sing a closing song. Thank you, Rob. And if you um, <clears throat> want prayer for anything, a couple, I believe, is going to be over here. 
And they're here to pray for you. And if you want to just pray, pray. Whatever you want to do, it's okay. So let's pray together. <clears throat> God, I'm so grateful for my faithful friends here today. Those who are joining us online, those who are physically present, those who will be watching this later on. I'm grateful that your word continues even to this day. You have penetrated our hearts, God. You're working in the world, even though so many headlines are concerning and daunting and horrible. Your promises continue that you will make all things new, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. That there is always a great reward with you and nothing we can give to you will ever be lost. God, I thank you for the testimonies of faith in this room, of faithfulness. Some who have been on the journey for decades and some have just started or restarted just weeks and months ago. Grateful, God, that you put us together. Grateful, God, that you've given us a place to worship. Grateful, God. And in your wisdom, you have tests and trials and hardships so that we be, can come mature and complete, lock, na, lacking nothing. Grateful, God, that you are who you say you are. You are true. You are faithful. You are the God of peace. So, Father, as we complete this service, God, as we sing this song, as we walk into the rest of whatever this day holds and whatever this week holds. God, I ask that you would help us to be encouraged, hang on to hope, walk forward, love you and love what you love, God, and despise things that you despise. Help us, we pray. Thank you that your word is true and consistent. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.